Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. My guest today should be familiar to viewers of Channel 2, only usually he's sitting in this chair and not, and not the other chair. Um, Reverend Greg Waller, I've known him for years. He's a, he's a native of Mayfield, Kentucky, a graduate of my old high school. But there's a question I always wanted to ask Greg, and I thought today's a good day to ask it, and it's, it's this. Greg left Mayfield, uh, went to Lambeth University, then graduated from Duke University. Well, actually, I went to Scotland first. Scotland first, but, but you're a graduate of the University of St. Andrews, which mm -hmm. is a medieval university of higher learning. It's right up there in the class with Oxford and Cambridge. And yet he came back to, to our part of the world uh, to minister. So that's my first question, Reverend Walter. What brought a University of St. Andrews graduate back to uh, Western Kentucky and Western Tennessee? Yeah, interesting question. I am uh, one of the things about British life that is most intriguing, that was most instructive to me, was this ability, this willingness, this sort of understanding that uh, every place is interesting. If you just dig deep enough, if you just get under the rocks. I've been to little tiny villages in Britain that have these enormous festivals around these little peculiarities that are nowhere else in the world, but they value it. They were a part of it. It was part of their history, and it become a part of their future as well. And so one of the things that a broad education, certainly in Britain, but at, at every stop, really, has been this, this awareness, this reminder that wherever you are, wherever you're placed, if you dig deep enough, it's interesting. It is valuable. It has a dynamic that's every bit as lively and engaging and important as anywhere else in the world. And yeah, we sort of get an idea that New York and, uh, you know, Los Angeles and and London are the only places in the world that things are really happening, but really in the, my education has taught me different and taught me that in, the, in, in many, many ways, the, in particularly the work of sin and salvation, which is my work, that there's not a lot of, it's all going on in whatever place you find and whatever place you're put, whatever place you're called. And so, as things unfolded in my life, I felt uh, more and more connected here. Yes, I had other opportunities to go other places, and yet nothing compelled me like it compelled me and propelled me mm -hmm. into this place. Now you mentioned in, in the opening, where did you go to school? What, what, what's the sequence of your education? Well, I obviously graduated from Mayfield High School. In 1972. Yep. I uh, then went to Lambeth University and graduated there in three years. I did some summer work. And uh, one of the things that encouraged me was the availability of a fellowship, scholarship, a rotary scholarship, uh, that my, my third year there to go overseas for a year. And I applied and was accepted into, as a Rotary Scholar and went to St. Andrews on a one-year non-graduating basis in 1975. And I went and uh, so thrilled to it and enjoyed it and was engaged by it that I stayed a second year, not on the fellowship but on my own, and took a degree and really came back after the second year because I was afraid if I stayed there a third year or more, I'd be there forever, and I really did feel like God had in mind a little something else for me. I, you know, that was a pretty big turning point. But I was two years in St. Andrews and uh, throughout the the British Isles, uh, really in terms of the education. Well, when did you there. when did the Duke come in? I came back from St. Andrews, having a Master of Theology at from St. Andrews, I needed to come to an American university and sort of get my practical theology about and credentials to be a United Methodist pastor. And so I came back to Duke immediately after St. Andrews for two years, and I took a Master of Religious Education degree at Duke and took care of all the 
credentialing for the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, again, had some offers at that point to come other than back to Western Kentucky and even in Western Tennessee. I, I ended up in Western Tennessee. What was your first church? My first church was Atwood, Tennessee, in Carroll mm -hmm. County, Tennessee. I know where that is. Very near Milan. Some of mm -hmm. people know Milan. Huntington, uh, Huntington over there. Between Milan and Huntington. And, uh, and Atwood. Atwood. Yeah, it I know. Was a, yeah. On the train. And it was at wood. That's the way they identified it. That was where they got picked up their wood on the <laughs> on the train line. And uh, anyways, it was a great place to start. And uh, from Atwood, uh, after five years there, I moved to Marshall County and was the director of the Lakeland Parish, the cooperative parish of uh, many of the Methodist churches on the lake side of Marshall County. And from there, after five years, I moved to Paducah, and I've been in Paducah for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I've been 30 years in the ministry, and um, and tw last 20 of them in and around Paducah, which is about as good a witness as I can make to the power of God to say a Mayfield boy, they took God took a Mayfield boy and set him in Paducah and asked him to love their his arch rivals. And that's uh, right. I've yeah. come to I've come to. Love and appreciate. And well, now, do, do, you, do you but do you, do you bleed red or do you bleed blue now? Well, I can I can never pull against Mayfield, but I can also pull. You know, when you've pulled the jersey on for anybody or anything, you can never pull against that jersey. I can't. But your and, kids went to Tillman. But kids went to Tillman, and I've pulled hard and vigorously for Tillman, and really across the countywide, I've pulled for the. I've come to appreciate McCracken County and Paducah and all the richness here and and learned how to broaden my loyalties in all sorts of ways. Well, being a history teacher, give us a, a historical sketch of the Methodist Church. I think the thing that intrigues me is the fact that John and Charles Wesley, who are uh, the founding fathers of Methodism, weren't Methodists themselves. They remained the Church of England. Right. How did that come about? Well... You know, historically, that the 1700s, the 18th century, was sort of the big push of the Industrial Revolution. There was this enormous upheaval across British Isles, really across all of Europe. You had the French having the same kind of upheavals, which resulted in the French Revolution in large measure. The uh, British had the same kind of upheaval going on. They had their own attempt at sort of upheaval in the, with the Cromwellian uh, time in the, in, the 17, uh, in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, they, uh, uh, the upheavals, which were remarkably similar to our current days, uh, some of the upheavals including, included this transition uh, from epochs, from an industrial, uh, excuse me, from an agricultural society to an industrial one we being in the change from an industrial to an information and maybe even a quick change out of the industrial or out of the information into the sort of the current pro uh, revolution we're in now. But um, they were in the middle of, a, of an enormous societal revolution. They had uh, their own drug problems. Uh, they were, th that was when the spiritus liquors were invented and mm -hmm. coming online. Gin, yeah. Every, gin. Everybody knew the result of beer. Beer was a long time there, but gin came with this intensive, different alcohol content, and it made people do crazy things. And so they had this big drug problem that they didn't know quite how to handle. They had these uh, bands of gangs that they called highwaymen. Uh, and Dick they were, Turpin and those fellows. Uh, that's it. Robin yeah. Hood and, and yeah. the whole, you know, that yeah. whole out, out. But anyway, had these amazingly similar kind of upheavals going on in that culture that we have even in ours. And in the course of that, uh, Wesley had this uh, very powerful uh, experience uh, with God. Uh, that called, was John you're talking that about. That was John Wesley. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Charles had had it before John had this deep experience with God and a call out to the, the masses of people that were not that were in the middle of this upheaval, that had not didn't have the resources of the church. Many of them had moved from the rural countryside into the city and didn't have a connection with the church. In fact, the law of the land was 
if you needed help, if you needed, you know, some help with your rent or with your out of food or whatever, you could only get help from your the, the parish that you were baptized in. So mm. if they were to get help, they had to go back to their rural roots, which they didn't do. They were planted in the right. city. So they were Couldn't dislocated right. from right. the church. Right. Lots of, uh, lots of things contributed to that. Anyway, all that is to say, Wesley had this vision about what it took to keep the revival, the renewal alive. He, he reached out particularly to the people who were poor and trying to make the change, wanted their lives to be different and better, and he gave them some little uh, organization to help that to happen. He helped them meet and become acquainted with these neighbors, the vast number of neighbors that were unknown and suspicious. And so those small Methodist class meetings began to help people get a little place to be located and a group of people for support and care and strength. They obviously had this spiritual energy from the renewal, from the West Methodist revival itself. Wesley worked among the working class folks, the coal miners, the shipyard folks, the folks who did the mining in the, uh, for the clay uh, in and around the, the China, Staffordshire, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Big, big groups of people there in the cities where it was just all these dislocated folks. And that was where he, was, he got his mm -hmm. attraction. Outside, the, and I'm sure you've seen it, outside the, the Museum of the City of London is a plaque right. where it says, My heart was Aldersgate. strangely warmed. Near Aldersgate. Near Aldersgate. What is the story of that? The story of Aldersgate is uh, this is uh, Wesley had been a preacher for uh, several years, thir 15, ten, you know, th 12 or 13 years, uh, working hard, diligently. He, uh, Charles has had a deeply moving emotional experience three, two or three months before this. Wesley goes to a prayer meeting at which part of the re regimen was to read Luther's preface to the Book of Romans and his commentary on the Book of Romans. And in the course of that reading, Wesley is overcome by this feeling, this deep experiential moment that all the doctrine and uh, things he'd taught and learned and taught others became experientially real for him. I felt my heart strangely warmed. He had this emotional experience. I felt that my sins, even mine, were forgiven. Mm -hmm. And that that really made a substantial experiential difference in his life. Now, interestingly enough, he still had doubts that haunted him until a year later when he determined at the invitation of George Whitfield, who came to America and was a great oh, what a Presbyterian powerful preacher. preacher and revivalist. Supposedly could make people weep by uttering the word Mesopotamia. <laughs> well, I tried know. that in class, it didn't work. Yeah, I understand that. Um, at any rate, George Whitfield invited him to the miners of Bristol. Mm -hmm. and he went and said, he was uneasy about preaching anywhere but in the church. But he said, I decided I was decided to become more vile. That was the way he put it. More vile? Vile for the sake of the gospel. And he preached in the open air. And it was the beginning. And he got enormous immediate response. And people were hungry to hear and to know what he was talking about. And unlike Whitfield, who could move people, Wesley could move people also. Wesley then put in place an organization. Wes Wesley had methods to help that revival sustain itself mm -hmm. and make substantial differences. And that's where Methodism came. It was a word of derision early on that, you know, he's got these crazy methods. He's a Methodist. And Wesley said, yeah, I do. You're right. I am a Methodist. And uh, me us Methodists, we help each other live this gospel out mm -hmm. in accountable, faithful ways. Didn't you pastor at a church in Paducah, St. Luke's Aldersgate? I did. St. And St. that, Luke's of Aldersgate, course, is the name. Old Aldersgate Church, and that's where that comes from. Aldersgate was actually a gate in the 
in the city, city wall, in the mm -hmm. city wall, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was uh, in a neighborhood that's still there. And, uh, and like you say, it's outside of a, of a, a little it's the museum, right? It's, it's, a, museum, it's a bronze, it's huge a, bronze plaque, a little, and, and it re, it's a, it's rather all the, the, the right. quote long quote. It's in sort of a in an area that's become sort of a shopping British yes, shopping it center is. kind it of is. thing. There. It is. It is. Well, now, didn't both Wesleys come to America? Only John. John did. John came to America. Um, again, before his heartwarming experience, in fact, uh, is and uh, had a uh, thought this was part of God's call. He came particularly to uh, work with the um, with the Native Americans. He was mm -hmm. particularly called there. He didn't have much encounter with them, but he did end up having a lot of interaction with the African Americans, with the slaves, and he be was fier fiercely against slavery. Mm -hmm. in his time but he was only, he was here for less than a year uh he had a lot of things going on and happened one of which uh was he he uh, started courting a woman sophia hopkins and um, as i guess uh, you, you did i'm sure when uh, it came to the moment when he was trying to decide whether he ought to marry her or not he uh called his buddies together to talk about it and his buddies uh not being very adept at this, said, you know, we don't know, who knows, or I don't know what they said, but anyway, they said, there's only one way to determine this, we'll cast lots. <laughs> and the lot came up, no. Oh. Don't marry her. So he didn't. And within about six weeks, she had another man friend, which didn't please Wesley at all, evidently, and he actually refused them communion, which in colonial times oh, that's bad. was an enormous mm -hmm. act, and they brought charges against Wesley for refusing communion to them. And Wesley left under charge. He left to avoid that charge. And if he ever had come back, I guess he'd have been tried wow. for it. But he left in uh, less than a year after that and he, having learned a lot really but he found another bride later did he not much later yeah much later yeah and that has its own story as well he was but but again i think what fascinates me is being read presbyterian that's that's john knox he, he's mr presbyterian and he was a presbyterian but yet john and charles wesley remained anglican pastors that's an interesting historical twist is that the founders of a church, did he intend to found a church or did he want to be a movement within the Church of England? He founded a mission movement of renewal. But within the Church of within England? Within the Church of England. His aim was to renew the church, to spread scriptural holiness across the nation, particularly in the church. Much like the Puritans had done before. Much like the, in renewal. Now, as it moved on, it became clearer and clearer to him that it was going to take the shape of a new church. It seems pretty clear Wesley was open to that. John was. Charles never was. He ridiculed every attempt, any possibility. When Wesley actually ordained some people to send across to America, uh, overseers, they became the first bishops of the Methodist Church in America. And West, John Wesley had done that because, as you can, this was in the 70, 1970, 1774, 1778, that kind of area. Well, you remember what was happening in America yeah, about then. Yeah. And a little any, trouble with the British. Anything British was suspect. Not many British preachers wanted to come over and serve because anybody with a British accent was trouble and suspicious. And so they didn't have many preachers available. Only the reason Wesley ordained people was so there would be spiritual leadership in American Methodism, mm -hmm. this renewal group. And, uh, but he did. And when he did, Charles Wesley almost severed ties. He was so completely against it. Mm -hmm. And Wesley had to sort of slip and do it because mm -hmm. it was a big deal. Now, in Britain today... Why is it that there's so many Methodists in Wales? Well, again, is the, the uh, there was uh, you find a lot of Methodists centered around the well mining, 
mining and industrial yep. centers. Yep. You find a big population in Newcastle, mm -hmm. big population in Wales, mm -hmm. big population in and around Staffordshire, Manchester, the pottery, right, right. Liverpool, yeah. big population uh, in London itself area, yeah. big population uh, over in the uh, in the other regions of, of right. uh, clothing. Do you have any percentages today as, as to what percentage of British folk are Methodist as opposed to Anglican and Catholic and Presbyterian and all I the have, others? I don't have any current ideas on that. In Wesley's day, uh, it was not as big a number as you might think. Uh, in Wesley's day, roughly, there was about nine or 10 million people in Britain. Mm -hmm. And there may have been as many as 60,000 Methodists mm -hmm. at any given time. So it's not this over, it didn't just overtake everybody. However, it was so centrally located and it had such amazing uh, impact on the communities that it had really more influence than its numbers mm -hmm. might suggest. Uh, the last letter that Wesley wrote was to William Wilberforce. Right, in his, anti -slavery leader. In, in his Britain. push towards slavery, and Wesley could not have affirmed, uh, you know, he was against slavery, and he could not have affirmed Wilberforce. Anymore. Now, there's a Wilberforce University in Ohio. Is it a Methodist school? I, I don't know. It's Honestly. religious. It was, has yeah. a religious I know uh, it is. roots. Uh, I don't know that. I don't yeah. know that. Another thing about the Methodist church always interested me is, is that um, you still have these Anglican vestiges in that the Methodists have bishops. Do. Uh, the hierarchy is very similar. Uh, explain that to, to non-Methodists. Well, uh, by and large, what it means is the Methodists believe in accountable oversight. And what, what, an high, uh, what a hierarchy effectively is, at its best, at its worst, you, hierarchies can be lifeless and miserable and ineffective. But at its best, uh, hierarchies involve supervision, accountable supervision. A group of people who are connected to each other and who have given themselves in discipline or under discipline, under orders, to a higher council, who a higher, a higher authority. And whether it is a superintendency or presiding elder, as it has been called, or whether it's a bishop, which has in biblical understanding is an overseer kind of position. What we affirm in that is that we believe that it's important to be under orders, under supervision, to understand ourselves not as a lone ranger, but as someone who needs, you know, I get up in the pulpit and say we need each other in this church. I get up in the pulpit and say we all need to have somebody like a preacher to help guide your way. Well, that would be very hypocritical if in my own life I didn't have a cluster of people to whom I was responsible as well yeah. and to whom I couldn't offer my... How many bishops, Methodist bishops are there in the United States? Uh, I think there are 73 conferences in the United States uh, and many more across the world. So a, a but, bishop uh, heads a conference? Generally. Sometimes they may share two conferences. They may, my, our bishop shares the Western Tennessee and Western and Central Tennessee and the Western Kentucky. There are two conferences in that, so we share one. So I'm guessing there are, you know, 65 American bishops, probably across the world, 100 bishops. But there is nothing say comparable to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the church, or is there? There is a president of the Council of Bishops, which interestingly enough, this year is an old buddy of mine from Duke days. I in fact saw him in, uh, in, uh, on a trip to uh, Washington DC. He was preaching there. And I saw my old friend who went to seminary with me at Duke. 
mm -hmm. and we had a great renewal. Renewal. He's the president of the Council of Bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, not a. It is not a. The, it, he does not have any authority above the authority of the Council of Bishops, and the Council of Bishops derive their authority completely from the General Conference. They are doing the bidding of this work of a thousand delegates, 500 clergy, 500 lay from across the church, democratically elected in all the... Judiciary. So it's sort of a federal structure. It is a very, very federal structure. It grew up with American uh, democracy and it has taken on that identity and that, that polity. It is, all, it is about elections and votes, and that has its own difficulties uh, as well. We, we all know the, the majority don't always get it right, <laughs> do they? True, true. And so uh, we're learning, you know, the differences mm -hmm. between. You mentioned that. Uh, that Charles Wesley never accepted <clears throat> this. Uh, obviously, the Methodist Church is different from the Church of England. Through the years, has there, has there been reconciliation between the Church of England and the Methodist Church? There has been. In fact, only recently have we uh, we have completely uh, we have open interactions with the Anglican community, including the Episcopal Church uh, in America and the uh, Anglican Methodist Communion in Britain and across the world. So it's mm -hmm. a very, uh, very interesting. Interesting thing. enough, too, if you go back to the really old churches, they're Methodist Episcopal churches. Which really hi highlights the structure more than the other denomination. Episcopal meant we had bishops, uh, whereas uh, other free Methodists or uh, other uh, kind of Methodists that were out did not retain that sort of polity, mm -hmm. that sort of organization. Mm -hmm. But Methodist Episcopal Church uh, South is really where that came from, mm -hmm. uh, retained its, its hierarchical mm -hmm. And of course the churches in America split over slavery before the Civil War. Did. But the United Methodist Church, when did the, did the northern and southern branches reunite? Came back in 39, 1939. And it's interesting, one of my old, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, one of my descendants, uh, one from whom I have descended, was a bishop at that time, a man, Bishop Moore, and he was very instrumental in that reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we did well, that. that. was considered, the Presbyterians came back together, I'm thinking we did it in the 70s or 80s, I can't remember, but, but it's the United Methodist Church and the United Presbyterian Church. It, it, it wasn't united at that point, it just came back to be the Methodist Church in 39. It became the United Methodist Church in 72 when we joined with the German branch of Methodism, the Evangelical United Brethren, EUBs. Okay. And they, the only difference in that denomination and Methodism were for a long time they spoke German and we spoke English. Like the Lutherans used to. Like for years. the Lutherans. Yeah. Yeah. And it became, you know, after 200 years, it became very, they, everybody spoke English, so there was no real reason to. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. I enjoyed this. We'll have to come hey, back and do this some more. Church fun. history is a fascinating topic. It's a good topic, and, uh, and uh, it has a real impact on current day approaches, indeed. responses, livelihood, vitality, even indeed. now. My guest today was Reverend Greg Ralder, pastor at Fountain Avenue Methodist Church here in Paducah. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.